Hello. Yes, sir. Your audio is there. Okay, so I will just uh, share the screen. Okay. Okay, my screen is also visible. Yes, so it's so visible. Okay, thank you, thank you, Manju ma'am, thank you, Smita ma'am, thank you, Mrudula ma'am, for the nice words. Uh, it's a great honor to be with Coaching College again. I think a few years back I participated in Osundi celebration itself. I guess like three years back or so. Yes, sir, sure. Sir. Uh, I am not an expert on Osundi, but uh, <laughs> I work mostly on climate change and related effects. Different anthropogenic interventions, which is altering the nature and how how it is affecting the real cycle of the humans. So that's what. And today's world laws on day. A wonderful day to remember. And uh, this year's theme, as uh, others said, it is ozone for life. And it is clearly indicated that uh, 34, 35 years of ozone layer protection, how it has benefited the community. Let's have a small look. The same slide which I presented three years back, like. Uh, it's a clear indication like when uh, people really intruded into a problem, the action and result, it has got a long-term sustainability. We were having an issue of uh, chlorofluorocarbons affecting the ozone layer. There were, had there been no protocol, it would have gone haywire. You, you, you might be seeing the no protocol red line going up. Had there not been any Montreal pro protocol, from uh, 1990 onwards, it would have been following the same trend. But you can see like the trend has been reversed. Uh, rather, uh, it has been more stabilized and it's coming down. And it's a very good sign when people and society and the country's nations have come together on a protocol to reduce the chlorofluorocarbons. The result was very good. So uh, the, uh, the ozone layer, it's got a big role in uh, climate and related activities and the uh, entire biogeochemistry. There are different uh, scientific uh, opinions on uh, the ozone layer and how it is affecting the temperature. People say that the southern hemisphere, uh, it, it's a bit cool because of the ozone layer there, but it really affects the circulation pattern of the ocean and creates a lot of issues related to the climate. So when uh, natural and human activities are there, it really affects a lot of problems. But in the case of ozone, when we had a clear cut protocol to contain it, we could succeed to a great extent. But whereas in the case of greenhouse gases, we are still struggling, probably because uh, chlorofluorocarbon, it's a, uh, it's a minor component. It, its composition is much, much less. And the address uh, the humanity could give it to was uh, uh, very precise. And uh, we could cut down really the uh, major chlorofluorocarbons, or we could change the lifestyle by adopting to better uh, mechanisms by which we can cut down those gases which are uh, destroying the ozone layer. So ozone could be protected. But whereas in the case of greenhouse gases, still there are a lot of questions. How best we can do it? Definitely we are changing a lot of our course, a lot of our actions, and uh, people are coming up in a big way. Uh, the representatives understand that there is a lot of problems. So greenhouse gases also, we are on a better way. It will not be the business as usual scenario. Things are going to change a lot. There are uh, real evidences happening all over the globe on this and there are different actions going to take place. So in general, uh, we look into any activity which can uh, definitely trigger such a greenhouse gas reduction. And one such occasion came because of this uh, pandemic situation, COVID. People were uh, really thinking like whether the lockdown has cut down the greenhouse gases, how it is affecting the ecosystem. And we want to think of our own uh, Memorand Lake, which is the ecosystem. Cochin College is also in the vicinity and part of our uh, citizen science network group. So I thought of uh, looking into Memorand Lake as a symbol of how the human activities, when it was uh, less interfering, how the lake behaved. So most of us know about Memorand Lake. For those who are not familiar, I am just giving an intro. Like it's a famous Ramsar site in Kerala. Uh, it's uh, having a strong uh, wetland presence, the adjacent cold land and Vemera Lake uh, form a strong wetland in the region and it supports exceptionally large biological diversity in case of flora as well as fauna. It's the second largest wetland in India and covers a large area of uh, nearly 2000 kilometers square. And uh, uh, there are a lot of instances of human interference happening in this ecosystem. Uh, it's said that more than 10,000 instances of land modification 
and the majority of it, it seems to be violation of the coastal regulations on guidelines as we are aware like the recent demolitions which happened in uh, uh, marad area because of the violation of coastal regulations on uh, the fate of the two large apartments uh, in the vembanad so uh, vembanad is a very important area which has to be conserved but at the same time there is a lot of dependence of the people living near the vembanad so it is considered as a critically vulnerable coastal area that indicates that the people living around vembanad they has got a they have got a large scale of uh, dependence on the aquatic body or the aquatic system of vembanad so it is identified as an ecological sensitive area at the same time it has to be considered in a manner that there is a strong livelihood requirement of this aquatic system for the people who are living in and around it so that is how it is termed as critical vulnerable coastal area now looking into the population density uh, we have in and around vembanad lake it's very high it is uh, said that we are having almost 810 uh, inhabitants for 1 km square area so that is the population density what we see in uh, vembanad and uh, the 100 meter buffer zone which is uh, in the vembanad uh, vicinity the bank of the vembanad the 100 meter buffer zone is very crucial and we can see even see that the population density in this buffer zone is also pretty high you can see the uh, in the figure c where uh, this yellow spots are coming it is uh, it is having a very strong presence because of the uh, retail value of uh, the land properties existing in this cochin area there is high population density in this buffer zone as i said uh, there is there are a lot of livelihood related dependence on this system maybe it's the agricultural related activities tourism related activities uh, fishing aquaculture uh, pilgrimages a lot of things are involved in uh, in and around the planting so uh, my prime or the prime concern of central marine fisheries research institute is uh, regarding fishing and related activities and there are a lot of small scale fishing and related activities happening in the vembanad so if we look into the lake per se this lake can be divided into three major zones the strong zone of uh, saline water presence near the bar mouth then the mid zone which is uh, brackish or estuarine and the up stretch upper stretch which is uh, fresh water we we can classify the activities happening in in these areas into different things like so it it can be the fishing what is happening in the estuarine and brackish area there are a lot of freshwater aquaculture related activities there are seasonal uh, agriculture or uh, aquaculture type of uh, farm activities happening in this zone so there are different activities happening in this area because of the human interventions happening in this area there are a lot of waste accumulation what is happening which is creating a lot of industrial pollution high nutrients and eutrophication this meadow of uh, uh icornia seen here it may be beautiful but it is a clear indication that the lake is dying because such uh, uh show, such a beautiful lake area is becoming shallower and shallower because of this uh, marshy vegetation which is coming up which is a clear signal of degradation of the ecosystem now with, we want to see like whether the lockdown did it help the vulnerable how it was as soon as the Uh, covid has reached uh, kerala in january there were discussions on how it is going to affect us but the initial phase went on uh, pretty well because we could contain because the number of cases were less but as the cases increased we were also facing the music uh, as in the case of the rest of india and there was lockdown enforced from uh, march on march so our expectation was uh, as clearly indicated in the picture like the member had is uh, highly polluted it's highly eutrophic so we were expecting that the lake is going to be uh, pretty good as uh, seen in the second figure but uh, the, is this the expectation or, or the reality is like the last uh, image which i was which i have shown so people are generally expecting that there are wonderful th- things happening because of the lockdown and in general most of the scientific literature which has uh, got a sudden attention of the reviewers and got published all most of them are citing like okay there is a lockdown happening and because of the lockdown all the activities have come stand still and uh, things have become clear there are images of uh, yamuna waters uh, flowing just like the people seeing himalaya from distant view because of the lack of air pollution but really when it comes to an ecosystem like vembanad is it so whether the waters have become clear uh, or is it something else so this is another image where uh, because of the lockdown and related uh, associated activities like because of the covid everybody started wearing mask using gloves and other things and there is no solid waste management happening and everybody in this are in their households so large apartments in uh, near the webinar 
uh, there is no proper waste management happening. So what was the net effect that happened in the lake? It will be interesting to look into this aspect scientifically. It is not a full full fledged study because uh, still the COVID and related pressures are continuing, and the scientists have got less means of assessing this effect. And but we have done some studies, and we are trying to look into how really the webinar has uh, affected the thing. So in general, when there is an environmental change happening during a lockdown, what exactly is happening in the nature? So the COVID has come down. Because of the COVID, there are a lot of regulations existing. The major regulation is the lockdown. So because of the lockdown, generally the business and related activities, factory, industry, office work, schools, colleges, and related activities all became to a standstill. So when such activities are coming to a standstill, it is giving a positive effect to the environment. That positive effect is like uh, the NO2 contribution to the atmosphere is coming down. The particulate matter, which are uh, here, the one which is addressed is uh, the aerosols, which are having a diameter of uh, more than uh, less than 2.5 micron size, and that was addressed at uh, more than 2.5 micron size. And uh, uh, the noise pollution, what is happening? Uh, the litter, the public places are having less litter because people are not going to the public places, so there are clean beaches. But when you stay at home, that time also, there is something what is being generated which is polluting the environment. And definitely, Vemmanad Lake also suffered because of lockdown when people are staying at home because there is no sorting of weight, waste uh, and there are a lot of organic and inorganic waste generated. And finally, some of them found its way as a dumping source to the Vemmanad Lake. Definitely, that has happened. So this is uh, from this uh, carbon is from a published uh, article in Science of the Total Environment. I will be discussing one more paper from the same journal, but in a different perspective. So there are two perspectives. One is creating a positive impact. Another perspective is that it is creating a negative impact. So both the things are happening. So during the lockdown, there are uh, reports coming like algal bloom chokes, Achenkoil river stitch. You can see like the thick mat of algae, which is there. So when algae, thick, thick algal bloom occurs, it, it clearly indicates that there is some sort of uh, 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 eutrophication happening in those locations because there are a lot of nutrients coming into the location that triggers the uh, bloom activity. So it indicates that there is organic load coming into the uh, river side. But uh, you can see the seaside. This is from Chellana. Similar to the Kumbalangi. This happened during August, August 4, 5, 6, 7. Those time we had this activity of uh, uh, blue color coming in and uh, the green color coming in. So the presence of two major pigments. And uh, we could uh, luckily get the samples, even though it was, Chelanam was, was on a total lockdown because of the uh, COVID cases increasing there. Uh, the flood also created a big mess there. There was a lot of uh, uh, sea coming to the inundated areas. So this type of activity happens in our uh, lakeward side also. Because Kumlangi is famous for, in the film Kumlangi Nights itself, there was indication of uh, such, such, such activities of heavy blooms occurring there. And we could trace back to the blooms. When blooms are occurring, the color of the water changes. So generally, we expect that the water color is blue. And with the presence of algal bloom, the water color tends to change from, from blue to light green, to dark green, to uh, yellowish green. So such activities happen. But it is always not so. Along with the blooms and uh, the phytoplankton present, the lake water is turbid. This is some of the uh, images during the flood. So you can see the color of the water. It is brown. So typically the uh, lake color can range from uh, light blue to green to dark brown. So this is how it is. So when it is green, the spectral color what is coming from the water is different. And when it is brown, the spectral color what is coming from the water is different. So these two spectral color what is coming from the water, it helps us to really classify, optically classify the uh, water. And uh, it, this helps us in uh, developing the uh, major light absorbing components. 
with bio optics so if it is brown if it is uh, green and if it is dissolved uh, color dissolved organic matter which is yellow substances or or self stone such uh, such compounds are also available this may not be visible to the naked eye but such yellow substances are also present in the water which gives the uh, spectral color combination and if we have a ternary plot you can have that uh, you can say that typically the membrane is a case to water in which all these three complex uh, optical constituents are present so when we look into the remote sensing reflectance characteristics of the membrane it is clearly indicating that it is having lot of presence of detritus matter and the color of the lake is more towards this detritus so if we have the uh, color varying in in different components in the membrane lake the, ma the the major dominance we can see is because of the situ disk the extreme right the third figure clearly indicates when sediments are there how it is when sedum is there how it is and when chlorophyll is there how it is and when water alone is present how it is so the uh, the spectral reflectance varies with the type of the optical components and we can clearly say that membrane is having a major input from the sediments so during lockdown a major thing which is studied in membrane lake is detritus or the suspended sediment uh, sediment matter or suspended particulate matter so there is a paper again in this same journal science of the total environment by uh dr yunus and his team they studied the suspended particulate matter and they could see like uh, uh, as the lockdown was progressing there was a clear reduction in the suspended particular matter present in the membrane lake they could uh, see it with the help of the satellite remote sensing images so they could see like progressively there is the reduction in suspended particular matter in the lake so but uh, this is one uh, one sim simple observation which can be made with the help of the satellite but when we look really into the complexity of the lake uh, we don't we cannot say that uh, progressively all of a such uh, there can be reduction in the suspended particular matter so we looked further into it we looked into how the chlorophyll concentration is changing from 2008 to 2019 to 2020 so we could see like uh, there is increase in the chlorophyll concentration so increase in the con chlor chlorophyll concentration means there can be some uh, suspended matter because chlorophyll also is part of that uh, uh, material it, it also gives a color so there is some good indication that the chlorophyll observations the chlorophyll observation is particular, particularly high uh, because of the less disturbances probably probably but at the same time there is eutrophication happening because from all the households there are a lot of uh, nutrients or organic things which are coming into the water now coming to the total suspended matter the total suspended matter had a progressive indication but we really see that the coastal areas were disturbed even during the lockdown time and because of the uh, disturbance in the coastal area and all of us know that the barmouth region of the cochin estuary is uh, undergoing continuous dredging for the shipping channel uh, depth so because of this dredging activity there are a lot of uh, suspended material available in the water but if you look from 2018 2019 and 2020 to 2019 was a year when a uh, lot of total suspended material was available 2018 it was comparatively less probably maybe 2018 april uh, things were okay and august we had strong floods probably all of us will be remembering like we had strong floods in uh, august and because of those strong floods the entire water column became churned a lot of particulate matter was already in the water so that contributed to high uh, total suspended matter in the year 2009 and probably that slightly started sub got subsiding because of uh, the lockdown and associated effects and plus uh, better conditions in 2020 so we could see like uh, uh, there are a lot of variability but still um, the total suspended matter has uh, relatively come down than 2019 so uh, uh, in the pre lockdown and uh, lockdown situation the total suspended matter we could see like um, uh, it is uh, definitely higher during the pre lockdown period and uh, slightly it has come down during the lockdown period so people were attributing different type this is another uh, video which was circulated widely in the uh, social web indicating that the membrane has become so good because of that lot of uh, uh, migration of aquatic animals happening from the coastal environment to the estuarine environment so this is one video which is widely circulated very recently we are not uh, really authentic about the video because it was circulated in social media but the people are speaking
so they are speaking malayalam and it's it looks like it is uh, happening in the uh, bambanad like vicinity only but uh, rather we could see like uh, there was a bloom happening along the area when the bloom is happening it's a clear indication that upwelling cigarels are much evident lot of uh, uh, nutrients are coming to the coastal waters and along with that there is something called oxygen minimum zone which is very much there in the arabian sea and recent studies have proven that it is uh, expanding more towards the eastern coast of arabian sea that our coast the oxygen minimum zone is coming much much higher compared to the um uh, western or somali or uh, the other coast african coast so we have a strong presence particularly in the summer the float sea in the summer you, you can clearly see there is a peak happening in the uh, summer along the kochi estuary region so when the minimum oxygen zone is coming it is a natural tendency tendency of the aquatic organisms to go to places where oxygen is available and definitely one such place is the estuary so they all move into the estuary and the estuary in, uh, along along with the minimum oxygen zone we have seen such uh, shoals of sardines going into the estuary so shoals of other marine fishes going into the estuary during such uh, occurrences of minimum oxygen zone so it is not clearly an indication of the lockdown uh, related factors but the other factors related to climate change is also having a big toll now we looked into the fecal contamination that is one another major contamination what is happening in the uh, vembanad uh, lake region one thing is like the spacing between the toilets and the drinking water source is much much less so generally we find that there is lot of fecal contamination happening because of lack of proper uh, hygienic or proper uh, scientific uh, sanitary mechanisms happening in the households so this this becomes a source for focal coliform bacteria and other enterobacters so such bacteria when they are present in the common water pool we can have an indication that this is going to be an unhealthy environment which can create some enteric related diseases such as vibrio cholera and other things so we did a strong pcr analysis with our team uh, in csir national institute of oceanography and it was enriched uh, the fecal contaminations from the memorial lake were uh, uh, have undergone pcr analysis and our analysis clearly indicated that the presence of uh, fecal contamination in may in general the fecal contamination is less present but uh, in may 18 uh, we had fecal contamination presence very strongly available in may 2019 we had uh, fecal contamination at least 1 2 3 4 four such occurrences were there but whereas in may to, uh, 20 it was uh, one one such strong occurrence or presence happening there but still the presence of fecal contamination was there in the memorial lake that indicates that even in the lockdown also the fecal contamination was uh, was very evident in the memorial lake so for studying all these things there is strong scientific data required so what we have looked into is mostly the satellite remote sensing and related applications to see like how the memorial lake behaved during this particular period but our hope is the citizen scientists like you like this was the photo which i took during your uh, last house day celebration when i came to the college and uh, discussed that was a different topic so now you are part of this citizen science network and our network is providing us with uh, some data sets which has which help us to assess the real condition of the memorial lake so almost uh, uh, 13 colleges in and around the webinar has become part of this network and we have developed a small equipment called mini sechi disk in this sechi disk uh, we have a color code which is from uh, 1 to 21 the one is for the light blue color and as uh, dark blue color and as the color, color moves to light blue to light green to dark green to yellow to brown to dark brown so it is given the color codes 1 to 21 and sechi disk probably being zoology students most of you will be knowing like this is this can be used for uh, the sechi the sechi depth is converted into turbidity so we have developed a mechanism by which if you have a sechi sechi disk you can measure the color of the water in the webinar and you can measure the sechi depth and send this information along with the the color image of the water body so that we can assess the image we can assess the color code the uh, very objective color code by which you have indicated the color of the lake and uh, 
the Secchi depth, which can be converted to turbidity. So this strong series and science network, which was formulated as part of the revival project of DST, a strong network is there. And this uh, uh, Secchi desk was developed by um, our, our fellow colleagues from uh, Plymouth Marine Laboratory, Bob and his brother Tom Brevin. And uh, uh, this uh, Tarbaco application was developed by CMFRI. So through this, uh, not only the college students are there, but also other uh, stakeholders. This is one such activity. Even uh, some working in the passenger boat, some working in the tourist boat, all of them have become part of the citizen science. And we are getting quality information from all these people, which facilitates us with long time series for extended areas. This has got a potential to grow, grow globally also, and you will be part of the citizen science network. The information on using the Sitchi disk is available in the CMFRI website. This uh, presentation will be available uh, with Manjumam also. And uh, you can look into the web links, download the manual, read it, and be part of the citizen science activities uh, and contribute to this activity. So based on the color code, you can see the different images. Basically, the colors what we are seeing in Vemerad is mostly from the color code number 11 to 21. So you can see the slightly greenish or yellowish waters uh, to light brown to dark brown waters. So these are the common colors seen in Vemerad Lake. So these are the images collected by the citizen scientists and we have such colors, uh, color images coming out of the Vemerad Lake. So the yellow color clearly indicates the, the yellow uh, dots in the first, first figure. It clearly indicates the number of observations we had from the Sitchi readings by the citizen scientists. So these observations are of continuous frequency in some zones. You can see like the Cochin uh, uh, city zone is very active. So some areas are not so active. So if we visualize the number of observations and if we plot it as the color of the Vemerad Lake, the third figure is the color of the Vemerad Lake. Based on the citizen science observation, this is the color of the Vemerad Lake. The third figure clearly indicates the color of the Vemerad Lake. So it has got uh, uh, critically different zones, and these different zones clearly indicate the uh, color of the Vemerad Lake. Sorry for the disturbance, just uh, uh, I got a small disturbance. Okay, so the color of the lake is indicated in the third plot, and uh, we got uh, uh, three uh, almost three different types of zones that indicates the up upstream zone, the mid zone, and the uh, estuarine zone. And now we have converted this into turbidity. So we could uh, uh, do some in situ measurements also, and our in situ measurements is at par with the citizen science measurements. So the turbidity were matching. We have checked this data for comparison in 2020 alone. The type of data, what we had for the pre-lockdown period, what we had for the post-lockdown period. So from the pre to post-lockdown period, as per the citizen science information, it clearly indicates that uh, the satellite data indicates that there is a progressive decrease in the uh, concentration of uh, uh, Per particulate matter. But here the images, uh, the citizen science images give a different version. They, 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 the, there is not much change. Like it is almost uh, seen that the pre lockdown period was comparatively better than the post lockdown period. This has got several other factors also. And uh, the number of data sets were comparatively less. So, uh, based on the available data sets, we could see like um, during the pre lockdown period and the post lockdown period, the turbidity things has got some changes. You can see the upstream, upstream, uh, the turbidity has increased. The midstream, the turbidity has comparatively come down. But unfortunately, uh, dredging and related activities were stopped for the time. Students in the network of the Cochin College also may. Uh, note this and do more active reading in this zone. Probably people are not doing much activities here. And uh, so from the CMFRI team also, more effort was 
to go to the upstream because previously we have noticed that the universities, the colleges, and other networks associated in the Cochin city area, they were very active. So we thought that some data is already going to come from there, but we were concentrating more on the uh, middle stream and upstream sites by uh, awakening the interest of those stakeholders there, we could get some data from there. But it clearly indicates that during the pre-lockdown and post-lockdown period, things are not much changing, probably because of uh, the uh, one reason that the population density is very high and because of the residential establishment along the river it, it has not changed so much. And in this stretch, the type of industries available are less and uh, more activities are towards agriculture, aquaculture and related activities. And those activities didn't stop because of the lockdown and things didn't change. So the occupations uh, in and around the Mambana didn't change much except for the traffic or movement or sound pollution and related things. The agriculture, aquaculture and related activities were happening because th those were small farm hold household activities. And people were residing mostly inside their houses and the domestic effluents which were coming from these houses were creating more organic load on the lake. So to study this, we, we, we are coming up with a one more new proposal, like we are already studying some of the activities, but we have come to know that the microbial health of these aquatic ecosystems, it is one thing which has to be studied in more depth. So similar to the way you are helping the scientists with the citizen science data to know the color of the lake, to know the turbidity of the lake. Now we have come up with a new application known as cleanse application. So since um, uh, I have moved out of CMFRA, this, this activity is coordinated by Nansen Environmental Research Center of India, where Dr. Nandini is working here. Email ID is given here. You can contact her. This application is also available. It is not in Google, Google Play Store, whereas Tabacco is there in Google Play Store. Soon it will be placed in Google Play Store. I can give the application file to people, those who are interested. This activity has not come in an established way because uh, we thought of this activity, seeing the microbial uh, health of the remnants uh, ecosystem. We thought like we should go for an app and we have developed the app. Then the lockdown came. We could not promote it, but this application is available and our next aim is to go ahead with this. So. In general, we could learn that there are positive and negative direct effects of lockdown in the lake. The suspended particulate matter concentration in the lake seems to be decreasing. At the same time, the chlorophyll concentration is increasing. The microbial water quality is unchanged, rather deteriorated in some locations. The water color and turbidity pattern seems to be improving, but with a lot of variability. There is increased waste from the domestic sewage and reduction in recycling seems to be a major negative effect. Decreasing greenhouse gases for a small period won't be a long-term solution. Citizen scientists around the league has got an active role to support the science and let us look forward. I um, take this opportunity to invite you to uh, install the second app also. At the same time, I uh, request that all of you should vigorously contribute, contribute to the citizen science activity which is ongoing with the college. If you have some queries of, or if you have some problems, there are still our people to address there at CMFRI, at NAO and Nansen Environmental Research Center. The satellite remote sensing related works are supported from a uh, Plymouth Marine Laboratory and our team is there. But uh, we had a loss of our mentor during the lockdown period, uh, uh, Professor Trevor Platiferas, who was the guiding force behind most of us uh, who are part of this project. Like uh, initially I got trained him uh, with him in 2004 and came to know about uh, the type of the global activities on ocean that are happening in different parts of the world. So this lecture is a tribute to our uh, uh, mentor and teacher and philosopher. Uh, so the activities done with the support of all the team, uh, his wife, Dr. Shubha Satyendranan, she is at Plymouth Marine Laboratory. The satellite remote sensing activities coordinated from there, where she and Jemma is, uh, Jemma is also working with them. And she has done that uh, satellite remote sensing imagery and related activities. So this is how we are uh, studying the webinar as on well now. We have got some in situ data sets also to compare. So a lot of information is coming in and we'll be able to comprehend it in a better way in the years to come with the support of people like you. So you should be more, in, more involved in citizen science and related activities. Professor Trevor was not only the guiding force for us, but he was a guiding force to many people who are uh, uh, in and around the world. And he has been uh, developing or mentoring a lot of capacity building programs and a lot of organizations also. I'll give a small presentation on that too, which will be of benefit to the 
student community as well as the teacher community who are present here they can avail such opportunities like how we avail the opportunities and learn all these things there are two major organizations i am discussing here one is the partnership for observation of the global ocean for which professor plapp was the founder and director he established this and the network which emanated uh, as part of this nano uh, so both those things we will be discussing in the slides it's a very small uh, set of slides of um, 10 10 or 12 numbers so this uh, partnership for observation of the global ocean it's a consortium of different oceanographic institutes around the world represented by their directors the idea is that oceanographic observations are required on a global scale and we should get this uh, information uh, through this network if we want to study some uh, important phenomena on a global scale so there are a lot of uh, activities happening as part of this network so the membership you can see like this is the wide range of membership in which this is operating so we have so many organizations involved so it will definitely be a, a great network to be part with and they are not this this network is not only for observations but there are three major activities only observation is one major activity second activity is professional training so those who are amateurs or those who are just growing in their career they are given some capacity building support by pogo uh, so the pogo is directly funding the students who are already doing phd in the country they can go for three months to get trained on a specific subject there are a lot of opportunities they can go on board on the vessel i will be discussing them in the future slides then the third activity is the outreach, outreach and advocacy what i am doing is an outreach activity sometimes we arrange specific outreach activity by uh, calling college students school students to make them aware of the type of uh, things what is happening globally on oceans so today the un has uh, major outreach activity in the form of ozone day so same way on ocean observation we have a major activity or outreach activity happening through pogo so the training portfolios are broadly divided into three categories the first one is the center of excellence where you go to a particular location in uh, this case the first one is the excellence at uh, the center of excellence at alfred wegener institute at germany where you can go for nine months it's a fully funded one you are up and down tickets are paid if you are getting selected you can be the get trained and the second one is the pogo score visiting fellowships which are generally for a duration of three three months where you can go and work with a single mentor whereas the nine months fellowship you will be working with multiple mentors uh the people from different disciplines and you will be learning about uh, the basics of oceanography also the second fellowship is a specialized fellowship where you can go and work with a mentor in a specialized area so that your particular career ambition is fulfilled by learning some technique which is important to you and in the second category you have regional trainings centers of excellence of regional training in is doing such activities then uh, nf pogo alumni network for ocean in which all this uh, major trained uh, people like there was uh, something called visiting uh, professorship like uh, in which i got trained and i became a uh, nf pogo alumni network member nano member then uh, there are institutes which are uh, hosting such activities then pogo is contributing towards a different workshop attendance like in case if there is a major workshop in this particular area of interest is happening pogo is giving uh, a small uh, funding assistance or grant assistance and there are major shipboard training happening there are four major shipboard training happening if a particular student is interested in acquiring skills on board oceanographic vessels you are advised to apply for this fellowship so these are different fellowships available under under pogo and this type of training has gone to 89 countries and 981 trainees are trained so far in this very specialized area in 2020 this is the statistics and uh, nano is the network of all these uh, trainers uh, and where we come together and presently we are doing uh, outreach program join global research projects join regional research projects in india the regional research project is coordinated by the nansen environmental research center where dr nandini is coordinating the activity she is also part of our uh, citizen science network in this uh, dst revival program uh, so all these projects are happening and uh, nano membership is for 330 past trainees from uh, 64 countries and the network includes 40 nano friends which are mentors and associates also
and the nano research projects are happening uh, in different uh, uh, parts of the world and these are the different countries which are hosting the nano projects so if you get trained if you are part of this you will also learn about this you will form part of this network you will conduct outreach activities and finally you will be not only contributing to your career gain but for a global cause also just like uh, how uh, we are contributing to the ozone related things you can contribute to a global cause by being part of this project so these are some of the major things some of the seminars what happened in this series and even the one of the seminars given by me also is included here and for details you can go to the website of both the organizations you can uh, mail them and ask them and in case of further queries other you can contact me also so now with this i will stop sharing my screen you can have some questions thank you very much sir for sharing your deep knowledge now open for the discussion i request dr mira menon to conduct the question and answer section thank you safna uh, dr grinson sir no superlatives for your fantastic class as usual you have class you also every time and uh, uh, there are a few questions which is here um, okay let us see what mr siddiq wants to know how this environmental issues in vembanad lake is affecting ozone layer oh. okay uh, that's why i told the beginning of the presentation itself like uh, there are a lot of uh, greenhouse gases which are uh, contributed because of the activities what is happening not only in vemerad but per se wherever it is and out of this ma minor contribution is by the chlorofluorocarbons uh, which are generated because of different activities so the montreal protocol was primarily to address the chlorofluorocarbons which are emitted by the different activities happening in this area so uh, that is specifically targeted and addressed so now every year that uh, memory uh, we are coming coming to our front forth and uh, uh, most of the techniques what are available it is all ozone friendly techniques because it was a binding treaty and almost all countries signed the treaties and things are going well there could be technologies which could be addressed for the chlorofluorocarbon which is a minor component of the greenhouse gases but when we look into the total environment the environment is affected by uh, now the major uh, discussion is on other gases other than the chlorofluorocarbon which are the greenhouse gases which are attributed to it now we have to address them and there are a lot of vocal uh, speeches or vocal seminars happening on those issues so my primary idea in this talk was to see like in memorand also there are a lot of changes happening we have to address these changes and for a real time monitoring it is very difficult for the scientist alone to take up such things so there are a lot of uh, support required from the stakeholders in and around vemerad so we were trying to see vemerad as an ecosystem and try to involve the stakeholders or the people in and around vemerad to generate some scientific data to study how the ecosystem changes are happening in the vemerad lake that's why precisely this project was there and you are also part of this network so Uh, precisely to the ozone net uh, ozone uh, layer how the webinar project is contributing there is no directly but looking into the montreal protocol we are trying to see like how we can have some uh, um, information which can really study the aquatic ecosystem and uh, make some changes so people can make such changes and such changes can bring changes for the Uh, upliftment of the women and also that was my sole motto of doing this presentation thank you sir i hope mr siddiq your doubt has been cleared uh, sir as a teacher i would just want to ask you a question uh, most of our students uh, the post graduate students after finishing their uh, syllabus they are actually uh, you know they are really in a blank situation they wouldn't they want to do so many things for the society or you know as part of a global outreach but they really don't know how to go about would you just suggest uh, what should be their next line of approach after they finish their pg if they are interested in one of these programs okay uh, like you are specifically asking for pg students since you are doing 3 uh, plus 2 programs after pg the chances of you to directly get enrolled in an 
PhD program, it is comparatively less because most of uh, the maximum funds in the global research is coming from US aid and related programs. So most of the fellowships, if you are applying, you, you will see that majority of them are going to US. So when you have to go to US, US insists that for joining a direct PhD after a PG program in countries like India, they require four years bachelor's degree. Uh, people with uh, three plus two, generally, they have got a problem. So if you get an opportunity for MS also, Master of Science Fellowship, you go and enroll in MS program, then do your PhD program. So you will come, come to know about the system and then uh, do the PhD program. So for doing uh, such programs, you may have to undergo GRE examination, TOEFL examination. It's a natural practice. And you should be knowing about the universities which are which is of your interest and who, who are providing such opportunities or fellowships. So you should be knowing that. Then in the very first semester itself, you try to clear the uh, GRE TOEFL examination so that in the second semester, you will be applying for the fellowship. Uh, you should be knowing the universities and other things and you should be applying for the fellowships. So by the end of the second, uh, second year, that means the next two semesters, your admission is secured, and as soon as, as soon as you finish your uh, PG program, you can you can go to US with the fellowship. That is one such thing. Second thing is that there are global fellowships available. Uh, one fellow, another fellowship for Japan is Mumbushe Fellowship. It's available in all uh, diverse field. You can apply for the Mumbushe Fellowship, and um, uh, on getting selected, uh, your travel scholarship everything is taken care of. So that is uh, another way you can approach for your PhD in uh, Japan in this related field. There are the, there is scope for fisheries and oceanography also, oceanography so related field field also. Uh, next is like different fellowships like Erasmus Mundus Fellowship. Then um, um, uh, if you if you are after MSc or uh, uh, you are employed in a uh, permanent position, uh, you can apply for the Commonwealth Fellowship because Commonwealth Fellowship is generally given for those who are in a permanent position. Uh, our own system, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, they are providing a fellowship known as Nedaji International, Nedaji Subash International Fellowship, in which the students are given uh, uh, up and down flight tickets and um, fellowship for doing uh, in a abroad university of their choice. Here, there is no restriction to the country because the fellowship is given by the government of India. There are a lot of fellowships like that. And in case if you are enrolled in PhD programs or MSc programs also, I told about some of the opportunities given by Pogo. I am not repeating it. You can go to the slides. In case of it's not clear, you can go to the slides. You can go to the website. There will be called. It is open for Indian citizens also. Many of us got trained in that. And you can also get trained in that. Go to the website and uh, apply for it. If there are specific queries, I'm ready to answer that also. Oh. It's, a, oh. it, it, it's, a, it's a large topic. You can right, right. speak. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, any 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 other questions? You can directly ask to sir if you wish. Any other queries? Well, I think they're all. Everyone is thanking you for the informative sessions, and we were impressed with the way so, you. I, I'll before concluding, just I want to thank uh, for the opportunity given. I am delighted to always talk with the students and the faculty. Um, uh, it's like uh, we are doing research on one hand, and sometimes we. We are unable to really uh, give the real outcome of the research into the platforms which is addressed to. So this is an opportunity where we can discuss with students on our activities. And in this particular activity, the interest is like the students can also support us. So please support us in this activity. It is very valuable and you are contributing to a global course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Gratitude is the fairest blossom, which springs from the soul. As we come to close of our webinar, I invite Dr. Vineet Kumar TV, Assistant Professor of Kuchin College, to propose a word of thanks.
हेलो विनीत सर हेलो आई थिंक देर इज सम नेटवर्क इश्यू विद विनीत सर सो आई जस्ट रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर मीरा मेनोन टू प्रपोज अ वॉट ऑफ थैंक्स ओके it's it's been an enormous presence and i can see uh, uh, so many students and colleagues of ours here around 250 of them so we are really deeply honored that uh, so many people have actually attended our webinar and definitely the credit goes uh, to the uh, uh, to the coordinators and the organizers so first uh, first for most let me thank dr grinson george uh, sir uh, he's he's been uh, as i said a wonderful mentor as he he told you earlier also he was associated with us 3 years back and association goes on still so thank you very much grinson sir for giving this wonderful session and uh, and you know there were a lot of i i i i understand i mean uh, we've been always you know understanding what what the issues of issues of the ecosystem and uh, there are there are so many things as a citizen charter we could do and you have always headed that and so we are very thankful that one you second. 